Hello everyone, my name is Julia Kreitzer. I am a senior here at the University of Pittsburgh and I am the dramaturg for A New Brain here with Pitt Stages. Uh, I am a cis white woman and I use she, her pronouns. I'm sitting here in my home office, also doubling as my bedroom. I'm wearing a gray sweater in front of a white wall. And I am here with some awesome participants to here today in a panel to discuss composing as it relates to the plot of our first um, tier one musical of the semester, A New Brain. And with that, I will pass it off to our leading man, Mr. Ryan Steinley. Hello, I'm Ryan Steinley. I'm a senior at Pitt and I'm portraying Gordon in the production of A New Brain. Uh, I'm a cis white man, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm coming to you live from Hillman Library, <laughs> seated in front of this white background. Hey, I'm Emerson Voss. I'm a um, PhD composer. Uh, I'm getting my degrees in music composition and theory. Um, I'm a cis white man. My pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I am in my bedroom, but to cover that up, I have this virtual background. That's pretty cool. I actually took this photo. Um, it's uh, in Squirrel Hill. It's on um, Hobart and um, where Hobart and Murray intersect. There's like a light pole and um, there's a bunch of staples from like things people wanted to do. And I just thought it looked cool. So I snapped a picture of that. And so my uh, body's in front of that. But I'm wearing um, a navy blue sweater and I'm pumped. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Itchery. I'm the Eberly Family Career Development Professor of Biological Science. Uh, so I'm a neuroscientist, but I'm also conductor and musical director of the Black Rock Philharmonic, uh, based out of uh, Black Rock City, Nevada. I'm a cis white man uh, with a big beard, and I go by he, him. And I'm sitting in a room with some of my sister's interesting tile art. Fabulous. Thank you so much, everyone. For those of us who are watching today, I want to go ahead and give a super duper brief synopsis of A New Brain, just so everyone is on the same page for exactly what we were talking about. Um, and then I'm actually going to ask Ryan to maybe get into some of the deeper themes and things that they are working with in this production. So first off, the basic synopsis of A New Brain, written by one of my favorite composers, William Finn. A New Brain is a show about making the most out of life in the face of tragedy. When a neurotic, frustrated composer is confronted with a terminal illness, he finds comfort in the healing power of art. The show is in the fact that William Finn's autobiographical account of his own battle for life when he was affected, afflicted with a seemingly terminal illness. As the central character, Gordon Michael Schwinn, struggles to survive, he finds salvation in the healing power of art. So obviously we are here with some wonderful composers and musicians here today. Ryan, can you talk a little bit about what Gordon does for a living, how this is central to the plot? Totally. Uh, so Gordon is a struggling composer at the beginning of the show. He's working on a children's TV show um, about a frog character named Mr. Bungie, um, who's his boss. He hates him because he's struggling with coming up with themes that work for children's music and just really has a hard time working with this craft. He would much rather be working on things that he finds more creatively compelling. And so this is one of the primary conflicts of the show. And then when he struggles with his brain condition, he realizes that he may die before having written something that he's actually proud of and something that he's proud to leave as his musical legacy. And so he begins writing music um, and just begins to craft more themes and that he feels proud of. And finally, at the end of the show, he writes something that he feels he can happily leave his legacy on, even though he now is able to live and keep going forward. And he's grateful for the time that he's been given to do that. Um, and also you're a pretty um, experienced musician yourself. So maybe what are some relations that you find um, overlap between your experience and maybe that of Gordon's? Uh, so as a musician myself, like I think it's a beautiful story about the power of music in finding light within a very dark moment. Um, it's only until the very end that he realizes that he's going to survive this condition. He is contemplating death and reflecting on it through song and reflecting on his life the whole show. And it's really profound, especially something that feels quite fitting during these times um, and what music can do for us and how it can bring us together in such dark moments. Um, I think that Gordon's conflict is um, one that's seemingly applicable to most people in contemplating your own existence and mortality, though it is somewhat grim. It is, um, you know, profound to think about what it is that will be left behind after you die. What is your, your memory, your legacy uh, going to be? Uh, I also think it's, uh, and 
considering his initial conflict with uh, Mr. Bungie and just the writer's block and just un being unable to craft something that he feels proud of. I'm currently working on writing my thesis and I sometimes relate to that in that sense of struggling with <laughs> ideas and creativity and stuff like that. Um, so that's one say, place where I draw <laughs> inspiration from to channel those emotions. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I've been a musician myself for quite a few years now. I'm primarily a singer, um, all different choirs, um, different ensembles. I love singing and so I'm glad to be able to share this story, um, especially one where I resonate so greatly with Gordon and his character. It's really meaningful and I'm really grateful to be able to take part in that. Fabulous. Thanks, Ryan. Thank um, okay, I am going to pass it over to Emerson, kind of in a similar um, path. Um, something that we had talked about um, in some of our preliminary conversations were that you have a lot of experience kind of trying to juxtapose using your passion as the thing that makes you money and also trying to keep your passion alive. And that's certainly something that resonates with Gordon's story as he's writing these songs for a children's show that might not be the most artistically fulfilling, but it is a way to monetize his music and his passion. So um, I'm curious what your thoughts on that were and um, how you kind of see this being a broader representation of the music industry as a whole currently having to monetize that passion. Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. Um, I'm in school right now, so that's like kind of nice uh, because like, uh, I don't know, it gives you like a drive, but also it's a little bit of an insular situation. So I think I'm lucky right now to be able to kind of be able to follow like ideas that I have and have like uh, something around me kind of holding me. But I did have like a year between my master's and PhD. And that was a really, really hard year. Um, and uh, like I had to try to be creative during, you know, like a 40 hour a week job at IBM, like in HR. <laughs> and um, it wasn't like the best job either. And um, I was doing applications and like that's really the only time that I've really had outside of school so far. So honestly, the hardest times might be coming up. I mean, maybe not, but um, I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, it was really difficult and I can totally like relate to that, like trying to balance that. I mean, art and money tend to not go together that well a lot of times. Um, and so, yeah, I totally relate to that. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see what happens, but right now I'm kind of lucky. <laughs> yeah, um, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's it's. I've known Emerson for a little bit, and I'm I'm very excited to see um to see that path that you're heading for, even if it's maybe the more difficult part. Um, yeah. Eric, I have a question for you. Um, so you have multiple entry points to this story, both as a neuroscientist yourself and as a composer. I'm curious, and this is also just based on my own curiosity. Do you see that these passions overlap at all? Do you find that uh, your research influences your music, vice versa, or kind of on the opposite end of that, how do you balance these two passions that are seemingly in two very separate sectors of academia and of the world? Uh, so at, at least for me, I've, I've largely kept them, the, the music and the science separately, but I will say that there's a, a tremendous number of scientists who play or, or write or, or do other sort of creative venture with a, with a, a big passion. And there's several faculty members uh, at Pitt and CMU that are playing all around the city. Um, and I think one of the, the part of the rationale behind that um, is part, science in particular can be very intense. And so it, to have that passion as an outlet um, and, and we've, uh, everyone so far has talked about stress and, and how stress can interfere with the creative process. Um, but the creative process can, can also relieve that stress, allowing you to do your best work, whether that be in the, in the arts, um, or in the sciences. Um, but for me personally, I haven't had, um, chance yet to, to study the, the neuroscience of music. Um, but it's, uh, it's always great to have those two passions in my life. 
Yeah, that's awesome. And that definitely rings true for um, for us here at Pitt. I know that it's probably a huge driving factor in, in this production is that we are such a school that is so heavy in terms of the natural sciences. We have a predominantly um, a student body that predominantly studies the natural sciences, and a lot of whom have also dipped their toes or have become super involved in the theater arts department. Multiple names uh, come to mind as students who have really taken charge of the theater department in a really tangible way and also are doing um, running research labs on um, biomes and other things that I have no idea what they mean. Um, and ultimately, that's something that is really exciting to me about this production is that I think it really intersects all of the different interests that are housed here within the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and for anyone who maybe is on the natural sciences end of the spectrum and doesn't have a ton of experience with music or composing, can you talk about what the process is when you sit down to compose, when you um, get ready to write a song. What does that process look like? Is it an idea that uh, you just write down everything and then kind of piece it together as ideas come? Or is it a more um, a proactive approach? For me, it's weird because I, uh, I actually hardly ever get musical ideas. Like I don't really uh, think about like some people get a melody or something. For me, uh, reference is like a huge thing in my work. And like, so it's almost always how can I describe um, something that's not musical or just in my everyday life? And how can I use music to say that? And I actually find that kind of helpful because it takes the pressure off of um, like, you know, is this music in itself good or whatever? It kind of just gets me to like, I have a job to do and I need to somehow make sound uh, relate to this thing. And that takes a lot of the pressure off of the, I mean, I've worked a lot to get my technical skills up, but it kind of gets my focus away from like the technicality. Um, like for example, um, I've done like a piece about uh, speech and you know, that is tangent, like uh, a tangent towards sound and music. But um, uh, like uh, I, I did a, a musical theater piece uh, about uh, speaking and like I'm interested in the relation between like what can music say and what does speech say and how are these things both using sound where one um, one has like a set meaning that has a lot of, you know, words have particular meanings where music uh, has meaning, but this meaning is a little more abstract and um, yeah, like so I, I wrote a piece where um, I had a. a a spectrograph analysis of someone uh, saying like a Wikipedia <laughs> article. <laughs> and uh, I took the those notes and then gave them to other musicians. And so uh, someone speaking on stage was only mouthing those words. And then the musicians were kind of filling in the sounds. Um, I don't know. So that's just like a little picture of how I think of things. It's a lot of times it's like, uh, yeah, going in through something else and then using music just as the medium. Yeah, yeah I'd have to say um, that's very similar to some of the best composing advice I received in my composition classes. H had a, a writer's block um, and the professor said, um, just try to, to paint with sound. Uh, something that uh, is poignant and, and powerful to you, a, a sunset, a breakup, or whatever it may be, um, rather than hoping that your brain comes along with uh, a, a fun musical motif. Uh, and that really opened a, a lot of doors. Um, I'll still sit down on um, e either uh, my horn or, or piano and just play around and be like, oh, that's a fun melody. Uh, but uh, I, I agree with Emerson. That's um, trying, and the more tools that you have, of course, the better you can do the painting, as it were. Um, but but that's spot on in, in my experience as well. Uh, oh, that's great to hear. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we can share some of um, some of Emerson's work. He has some some really wonderful stuff of what I've seen. Um, a question I have uh, for Dr. Itri. Um, maybe this is getting a little bit into our second conversation. Um, but obviously, the big the elephant in the room is that Gordon has 
an incredibly traumatic medical episode happen throughout the show. And I'm curious, um, obviously we know that this influences his day-to-day -day, um, quite frequently. Um, because you deal with motor control and decision-making and all of these different factors, I'm curious, could you explain what is happening to him medically? And then also, does that influence our motor skills in the terms of like making music? Obviously, Gordon is struggling with writer's block here, but from a neurological standpoint, is there possibly something more going on? Uh, so the easiest way to uh, to sort of describe um, what's going on in, in his brain is, is that it's uh, halfway between a a stroke and a tumor, um, but one way or another, uh, it's not good. And um, a, as the musical gets into, uh, may require opening up a hole in the skull and and getting down uh, into the goo of the brain, which is something that uh, even without a medical background, most people would agree it's to be avoided. Um, in terms of how a procedure like that could affect the production of music, um, uh, certainly th the brain has, has specialized areas. Some are more involved in the control of movement or vision or hearing. Uh, and then up in the front part of the brain is, is the creative process. So depending on where this is, uh, you're more or less likely to affect the, the, the physical ability to press notes on a, on a, on a keyboard um, or more of the, the creative process or to read music, depending on, on where that is. Um, going the other way, though, I think is a far more fascinating question um, and I'd, I'd bring up two patient cases. There was a, a famous conductor and composer uh, in England who, uh, because of, a, of an injury fairly similar to this, uh, uh, this in the show, uh, he had only a 10 second memory. Um, and so he, every time he saw his wife, he, he remembers her from before the, the injury, but it's as if he hadn't seen her in 10 years, which is fantastic to see. But the craziest thing is he still plays music at that expert level. He didn't forget it uh, and can uh, perform pieces fantastically. Um, and, and it just sort of takes him out of that memoryless world and he gets absorbed into it. Um, if you YouTube um, no memory musician, it'll probably something will come up. Um, the flip side is um, a case study where someone dove into the pool, had tinkered around on his mom's piano a bit as an adult, um, got a, a severe concussion, uh, was rescued, and now composes uh, a symphony every week. Um, no, we have no idea how, and it's super, super rare, but sometimes injuries may lead you into a position of being a musical savant. Um, and actually to get back to Emerson's point, he, he, he has a difficult time explaining it, but he just sees the music and it comes out of his fingers. He just moves his fingers on the piano to what he sees. And it's absolutely incredible. Um, uh, NPR and several other groups have, have done stories on this, but um, the brain and music are so, some weird and wild places and it's fun to see their intersection. That's, that's so fascinating. Um, wow, that's so cool. Um, okay, we are nearing the end of our conversation here, but um, maybe my last question before I open up the floor and see if there's anything anyone else would like to add is for Ryan. Um, obviously this is a, not so loosely autobiographical piece about William Finn. Um, and I'm curious, how much are you actually pulling from William Finn, who, like I said at the beginning, is one of my favorite musical composers? Um, and how much do you feel like Gordon is separate um, from William? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I guess I should preface this by saying I do not know William Finn personally, so I cannot necessarily like explicitly confirm what to me seems like William Finn and what doesn't, but I'll try and answer to the best of my ability. Um, I think that generally speaking, Gordon is very much representative of William Finn as an individual. He is composer, um, uh, 
uh, just all the facets of his life and like a granular level, like um, he's gay in a relationship with someone. I think that those are all representative like of him and his identity. However, I think that their life situations are a little different. Um, if I'm correct, William Finn found out he was diagnosed with a condition like just after he had won a Tony for <laughs> falsettos. Um, so he was in a much more successful position than Gordon was um, at the time. And I think that that predicates much of the conflict and struggle that Gordon is experiencing because he feels like he hasn't accomplished anything so far and has so much left to say. Um, one of the fa one of my favorite lines in the show was right after he's been diagnosed and he thinks he's about to die, he talks about all the songs I never wrote, all the rhymes I never made, all the stories I delayed in telling. And then he feels this impetus to begin composing even more fervently on his deathbed. Um, and I think that that might be something that was perhaps a little bit different with William Finn in story and Gordon's story. I do know that William Finn, um, he wrote a lot of music in the hospital and I think some of it even ended up in the show in this form, just loosely. Um, but I think that there perhaps like motivations for that were a little bit different given that they were in different life situations. Um, but I think that on the whole, they're very similar and that Gordon is very much perhaps from the same cloth as William Finn. That's so interesting. I didn't realize the the timing uh, as to when he was diagnosed. That's that's a really interesting thing to take note of. Have you ever written about like your work? <laughs> like, has that ever come into your writing? And what do you play again? I forgot. Uh, so I play mainly low brass. Uh, you know, oh, like a gotcha. composer, I I can do piano. Depending on what instrument I've been playing lately, uh, because of those, uh, you know horns uh, are big uh, on fifths and thirds just because of how you play play a, a trumpet or a trombone um i find my music ha is a is a lot more open fifthy uh, for instance yeah. but when i've been playing piano more more often uh i get a lot more chromatic um yeah. but yeah so i i play uh, low brass i also play Actually, I have a sousaphone that shoots a 20 foot flame out of the bell. Uh, really, dude? <laughs> nice. Uh, not, it, it's a little bit of science and a little bit of, uh, of music as to how to get it to happen. Did you make but, that yourself? Uh, I made it with a couple of friends who actually knew what they were doing. Uh, so not, what's the flame? What's feeding the flame? Uh, it's uh, just like a propane grill gone, gone wild, um, but it, it's uh, really no different than, than a propane grill. Can you like move around with a sousaphone and it's like, is it mobile or yep. does it need to be hooked up to something? Fully mobile. That's excellent. Free, but, uh, it, it's fully mobile. Um, and I've played it around the city and lots of other places. Um, but I haven't done much writing in terms of music and, and, and neuroscience. Um, I've been, yeah, I've done plenty of, uh, writing and, and other things on, on one or the other, but not the, not the blend. Um, in part because for me, I really don't have a need. And there is also some benefit that I can keep, uh, keep them uh, separate. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> one, one can serve as a relief from the other. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, you can check out tickets for A New Brain at play.pit.edu. Um, and yeah, we open on February 18th in the Stephen Foster Memorial in the Charity Randall Theater. And thank you so much for watching our conversation on composing today. Be sure to uh, check out our conversation with some more neuroscience experts uh, to be posted just to the same YouTube channel after this. Thank you so much, everyone.